Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm senior editor Denton Davidson here with Oscar winner Paul D. Osterberry, the production designer for Blitz Bazawule's The Color Purple. Paul, this was a big responsibility to take on this retelling of a classic film, a classic novel. What excited you the most about becoming involved in this project and how were you ultimately brought on board to create this world? Well, it was exciting as well as intimidating. You know, obviously it was an amazing book to start with. Spielberg's obviously very well received film and uh, and then the Broadway musical and then obviously now a, re a, a mixture of the Broadway musical and the film and the book. Um, and I've never done a musical before. So, but you know, this is why we do these jobs for challenges, you know, and it's a great challenge to take on something like that, but also a great responsibility. Um, but it ended up being a, a lot of fun, you know, so. When you're putting a different spin on a classic film like that, do you reference that at all? Or do you try to avoid that at all costs? Like where, where do you land in that? Yeah, actually, at the beginning, obviously, I read the book again um, before my first meeting with with Blitz, and I did watch the film. That was about six months prior to me actually starting on the film. Um, and then I then I, I try to kind of put the film aside, and there were no, there was no, I couldn't find any footage of the Broadway musical, so that was fine. I didn't have to worry about that. And then we started listening to the music. You know, Blitz is a filmmaker, but he's a musician first, so he had the music worked out, and we'd listen to the music while we were scouting, and uh, we talked about the music quite a number of times. Um, and then and then we, you know, because Blitz's take on this one was this sort of uh, using Seeley's imagination to take us take us to places and have her escapism through that. We really we realized that we needed to be very realistic in the the setting first, and then we're allowed to, you know, explore when we get into those um, uh, imaginations. Um, and so really, it would start with a ton of research, which, you know, and, and Steven's and Spielberg's version would have been the same. You know, I found some of the same references, I'm sure, because I saw images that I found in a picture that were in in that film and that that we put into our film near the house, for instance. But but really, we wanted to start just as most period films in, in a heavy uh, research phase first before we launch into the um, the other the other stuff and 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 then thinking about how to incorporate the incorporate the dancing and the choreography into the set pieces and whatnot. And and you know, one thing is we didn't want to be very grand. You know, it was a very, the settings were all quite small. And you think of, when I sort of think of, of musicals, you think of big Cedric Gibbons kind of designs where, well, we did get a bit of that in our film, but, you know, generally one of these big, massive numbers would take up a lot of real estate, but but that would have taken us outside the kind of story that we're in. We're in a very small scale, uh, small town uh, story. So we had to really think about how to portray those dance numbers with Fatima's choreography in more intimate spaces. And that was a bit tricky, actually. And the movie comes out December 25th, but there's been some early screenings and, and the recent premiere. Um, I was at one a few weeks ago and by complete chance, I was sitting right next to you. <laughs> um, what what has it been like now to actually see the film on the big screen and get the audience feedback? Because the uh, when I the one I was at, the audience was was cheering and people were crying and laughing. What is it like for you to to have that experience with the audience? Uh, it's 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 what you really want to have you know um i had only seen the well that that one where i was sitting next to you that was my first screening as well and with an audience and as well on a on a screen i'd only seen it uh on a small on pics like a little you know small version on my laptop um and so it was really lovely to see with the audience because as you said the audience was yelling at the screen cheering clapping it was really you know uh emotional and people did get very emotional this you know, there's a certain scene when she sings I'm here and I'm sort of thinking a bit emotionally now again. Every time I saw it, I watched her sing it live at night outside when she comes out of the out of the store towards the end. And, you know, this is her a moment. And, you know, you get a bit proclaimed thinking about it. And I watched the dailies over again and then you watch it in the, you know, you watch it in the cinema and it's like, and then everyone else is in the same, the same way. It's really exciting to feel it with a, with a group because it's quite a, it's a big ensemble cast film and it's a big, group kind of movie in a way um you know, there's lots of different you know you can you can associate with many different sides of this and, and and the various characters so and you've worked on everything from your oscar winning moment in the shape of water to superhero movies like the flash and horror movies and even christmas movies yes so you're open to genre absolutely, absolutely. what type, absolutely. what is the, what type of film does draw you in and does the fact that this one is a musical does like does that affect production design, the fact that it's a musical? 
Um, it, it affects certain choices one has to make, but generally speaking, no. I mean, the movie still has to work in the dr dramatic portion. You know, it still has to. You're still there to help try to tell the story for the director, help elevate the story for the director, and that doesn't change. I don't think, no matter what the genre is. I mean, that's that's what you have. That's what the job is. And so, first and foremost, that is what you're doing. And period movies, you base it on reality, and and then as you get into those other genres, you know, you're a little more free. But I, I actually quite like period movies. Um, I, I'm not sure why. I always thought I wanted to do a space movie or something, and actually, I don't really have as much interest in those. I like doing some of it, but not not like an entire film. So. Uh, it's 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 just still the same thing. It's just different. And I think by being able to be free to do different genres, it just keeps your mind free and open and, and it makes the job more exciting and interesting. And when you sign on, then you have to sort of go out and scout things out. How did you land on the location for this? And did you know that you were going to be in Georgia? How did you find the exact right space? Um, well, actually, the first this is my first movie in 30 years of, in the business that the movie was actually set in this state or the location in theory that it was that it was written in which was amazing um so no georgia was already picked before i came on and um but it was obviously the correct choice even though we were based in metro atlanta it's rural georgia we still have to go out to all these small towns and of course the coastal part which i talked about a little bit um down in savannah and, and jekyll island we ended up going down there but it's a location heavy movie and um and john latenza was our location manager he had a lot of experience and he knew georgia well so we went, we did a lot of car time, Blitz, John and myself. And uh, that that's, again, to help ground it in reality. And and even some things we didn't choose, we took a lot of documentation and they ended up being referenced for the set builds or other things that we we created later. Is Jekyll Island where those beach scenes are? Yes, yeah. Yeah, that's the dead tree, the dead tree. Uh, I think it's called Driftwood Beach on Jekyll Island. Was that, did it exist like that or did you build those branches out? No, I, I, that we, luckily, you know, John convinced, it was a bit tricky, but we convinced them because the park is very, you had to be very careful around them um, for erosion. They, they, they are dead because of erosion. They were beautiful live oaks, much like the original tree in the film, which they do the patty cakes and where they ending, that beautiful ending around the sort of family tree. So that was kind of a counterpoint to that beauty. It was kind of the beauty and the death of that, of, of those same trees, but on the beach. Celie's home, you know, talk about her, someone of her race and financial status and, and what it would be like living for her during that time. You know, what sort of pieces and design elements go into creating that world for her and that home space? Uh, you mean Mr.'s home, I guess, right? Mr. and Celie's yes, home? Yes, Mr. Um, you know, that house was a fairly big house, actually, I, I imagine for for a, a family like this, but but it came through, you know, we imagined it as uh, not the best land. It was a bit, there was floods, it was prone to floods. It was uh, in reality, this land, because we had to plant all the crops and everything in there. Um, and, and we, it was big enough for us to shoot, but, but it's, again, the scale of it was not an antebellum style house or anything like that. It was, I think, appropriate sort of scale based on a lot of research that we'd seen you know it could have been a, a white farmer had given up because the land wasn't so great and then it ended up being taken over by by the grandfather or the great-grandfather I think in this story um, and passed on through the, the generations again it was things don't change very much during that time I mean I mean even my grandparents their furniture didn't change a lot and so it's quite minimal you know um, we kept it quite spare uh, Larry Larry and I kept it quite spare in there um there was the, the patina and the age of the place gave it character and, and you know, there was very choice pieces, but not not cluttered. It wasn't like crazy cluttered, except obviously when it was a disaster when she first arrived. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a conscious choice. And a conscious choice, even though we had to do, you know, 35 years of evolution of the sets, just minor things changed from gas lighting to more electric, you know, electric radios, small things like that just would show the passage of time. But because reality is I don't think that much would change except costumes and cars and things like that. And one of the most fun spots is obviously that juke joint. Uh, what was the most complicated part about building that? Well, just building it was the complicated part. First yeah. of all, we, we had scouted a location in uh, Savannah that was a real a real swamp. But of course, the water levels, you were at the ebb and, ebb and flow of rain and everything. You have no idea where the water was going to be. It was a long way from Atlanta. So we found a place near Covington, Georgia, uh, that was a plantation that was a... a hunting and fishing, it had been turned into a hunting and fishing uh, place. And so they had dammed several ponds or lakes with existing trees that died and ended up being like a swamp. So we were able to go in there, pick our favorite one. I sort of 
through aerial footage and we just laid out where we thought it would be nicely suited. We cut a few, well, first of all, we, did, we could drain the lake. So we drained it down halfway down just so the area we were going to build in was dry or muddy at least. And we put swamp mats down, drove the piles in and built the set. The biggest set, we did the juke joint first and then we went smaller as we went. We went for, it went from small to big in the movie, but we went from big to small because of logistics. And then we filled it back up. It took about a month, three weeks, I think, to fill back up again. And then we shot it and we had that beautiful scene with Taraji, like Cleopatra coming down the Nile and entering, you know, in the red vibrant headdress um, on the barge. And that barge came from the Spielberg movie, actually, because the piano arrives in the daytime. The music source arrives into the, the, the juke joint in Spielberg film on that barge. And so I took that idea, but changed it. You know, the musical source was this amazing character, Taraji in her vibrant red. She comes in like Cleopatra on the Nile into this place. And the tricky part there was, you know, we blended being on um, the location, which was quite small to the studio set, which was also quite small, but, but we were able to wild it. And, and I think it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty seamless transition. You know, uh, I don't, I don't think it's very, no, not many people are going to tell that we actually did that on the stage. So. No, I certainly could not. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned we sort of see this world through Celie and she's got these fantasies. And one of those sequences is this really cool performance with Fantasia and Taraji. And they're singing a duet on like this giant, is it like a gramophone or phone or a record or? Yes, that was, yeah, that was I, a gramophone. Yeah, I remember that. seeing that and I almost, I stopped myself from like, leaning over to you and saying, is that real? Like, is that CGI? Like, but it is real. You can put it on the panel. How did you build that? Where did that idea come from? Because that's a really great scene. It it was, well, when I got the script, it was written in the script. I, it might've been a Bliss, Bliss's idea, I think, because he had, when he pitched the film, he had pitched that scene. And that's what encouraged Fantasia to take the, to, eventually Fantasia took, she, she committed to it because of that particular scene. So, you know, obviously then it was sourcing the beautiful gramophone to start with. And then really it was like, I think it was 22 times bigger or something like that, or I can't remember, or was it, maybe it was 22 foot diameter record. Um, but it was a, a, it was fun. It was a very simple idea. And again, Dan Lawson lit it with a very, very simple source. It's quite beautiful. The, there was a bit of CG, the, the big horn, which was, would have been massive in the stage, yeah. would have gone beyond the ceiling was was created digitally but the rest of it the, the, the needle and the record and everything was all practical and it was fun it was a fun little piece simple is there a particular set of uh production design element that you are most proud of or maybe even just one little piece that we might not recognize but you see it and you're like god i love that um well i, I my favorite set was the the juke joint but uh uh you know i don't know it's tough it's a very tough question uh, not, if you sort of, I think honestly, the thing that, that I'm most proud of is that the tree at the end. It's just a beautiful ending, and it has not not much to do with me. It was more about, yes, it was. It was choosing and coming up with the idea, but and it was all set dressing and beautiful quilts and everything that she'd been in theory sewing the whole way through, the whole the whole um, film. Um, but it's one of my favorite pieces, and it, it's 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 not you know it's just a loca it's a location, just a gorgeous natural location, really. And sometimes those simplest things can be the nicest. You've worked with so many directors, I mean, legends like Guillermo del Toro. What is, um, what was it like collaborating with with Blitz on this and and sort of seeing his vision and, and him coming up through his career? Yeah, Blitz, you know, the nice thing with Blitz was, you know, he hadn't done a lot beforehand. So um, he, he had a lot of ideas just itching to come out and be able to express them. Um, he was... Um, like I said, the record player, I think the gramophone was was his idea originally. Um, and so he was quite open. What was nice about working with him, he was very open to taking ideas from Dan and I and working together. It was a real collabor collaborative collaborative effort. Um, but he he was uh you know, like he was very receptive to what any any you know, he can draw. He's very he's like a rena renaissance man. He draws, he paints, he did this whole storyboard. Uh, animation that he did that he put all together the storyboards and put it to the music and the store and the and the dialogue for about two hours and we we all watched it and of course the movie evolved from that we we didn't shoot exactly what he had storyboarded but that was early on but just to see that he was able to put that all together for us was like a really nice thing to be able to grab a hold of and then we can then develop and uh, uh, and and execute some of those things and then come up with better ideas or bigger ideas for some of the other ones but it was really great that he had that all started out uh, from the very, very beginning for us all to, to work from. 
And you were a kid in Ontario who wanted to be an architect. That's a long way from Hollywood. Uh, uh, how did you end up on your first film set? Uh, it, it was kind of fluke. I I, uh, I used to, when I moved from university from Ottawa, I went to uh, uh, Carleton University there. I went to Toronto and I ended up renting a loft, you know, in this one of these sort of industrial kind of areas. Um, and of course, those are the kind of areas that lots of filming takes place. So I worked as an architect for a couple of years. There's always these film trucks with big lights and a lot of people standing around doing nothing, it seemed to be for me. And I'd stand around, ride my bike home after going out in the evening and stand there for a while, wait, 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 something would happen. And then nothing would happen again for another 20 minutes. And I was always kind of piqued my curiosity. And then uh, eventually I just happened to, through my social group, meet up with a bunch of people in film. And eventually I, I got disillusioned a little bit by architecture. And I, I said, I just want to volunteer. So I volunteered and I was in the art department. And I was given a job driving a truck, just a sort of seat, set deck truck. And I was just able to start there and see what, if I liked it, if I thought it was fun for me. And then I worked my way up up the ladder, you know, joined the right union, correct union for what I was supposed to do, drawing. And uh, and my architectural skills translate, you know, quite well into into film. So it was a bit of fluke, to be honest. I'm happy. And then, worked, and then it worked out because you won an Oscar for The Shape yeah. of Water, which yeah. well, I mean, that was a huge night for that film. Um, what was that night like when they, what do you remember about when they called your name and just what's the wildest memory you have about that Oscar ceremony? Well, I, I almost tripped, I tripped going up the stairs and I remember this thing, this jokey thing at the uh, Academy luncheon where they said, whatever you do, don't trip going up the stairs. And I, I caught my toe on the first one and almost went down. I thought, I don't know if I really was looked that bad outside, but from my inside vision, it sure seemed to it. It was it was a bit of a dream. I mean, I, I the year before I was doing a commercial in L.A. and I went to the, uh, you know, they have the pa the panel where everyone sits on the stage at the Egyptian and talks about it the day before. And I was like, wow, I'm never amazing. These people got here. I'm never going to be there. And then sure enough, just the next year it happened. It was quite a a, a big thing. I, Blade Runner, I thought was going to win because, you know, I love the original Blade Runner was one of my all time favorite production designs. And and that version was an amazing one as well. And, and it was such a big budget. And we had this small little film that uh, the little one that could I guess because we did it was a, a big a big hit well I hope you just continue to get even more recognition for the color purple it's a uplifting and beautiful film to watch and Paul thanks for sitting down and chatting with Gold Derby today thank you very much thanks Nathan